The Decameron by Giovanni Boccaccio, translated by H. M. Rick. Day the First, the Introduction. Beginneth here the first day of the Decameron, in which, when the author has set forth how it came to pass that the persons who appear hereafter met together for interchange of discourse, they, under the rule of Pompinea, discourse of such matters as most commend themselves to each in turn. As often, most gracious ladies, as I bethink me, how compassionate you are by nature, one and all, I do not disguise from myself that the present work must seem to you to have but a heavy and distressful prelude, in that it bears upon its very front what must needs revive the sorrowful memory of the late mortal pestilence, the course whereof was grievous not merely to eyewitnesses, but to all who in any other wise had cognizance of it. But I would have you know that you need not therefore be fearful to read further, as if your reading were ever to be accompanied by sighs and tears. This horrid beginning will be to you even such as to wayfarers is a steep and rugged mountain, beyond which stretches a plain most fair and delectable, which the toil of the ascent and descent does but serve to render more agreeable to them. For as the last degree of joy brings with it sorrow, so misery has ever its sequel of happiness. To this brief exordium of woe, brief, I say, inasmuch as it can be put within the compass of a few letters, succeed forthwith the sweets and delights which I have promised you, and which perhaps, had I not done so, were not to have been expected from it. In truth, had it been honestly possible to guide you whither I would bring you by a road less rough than this will be, I would gladly have so done. But because without this review of the past, it would be not be in my power to shew how the matters, of which you will hereafter read, came to pass, I am almost bound of necessity to enter upon it, if I would write of them at all. I say, then, that the years of the beatific incarnation of the Son of God had reached the tale of 1348, when in the illustrious city of Florence, the fairest of all the cities of Italy, there made its appearance the deadly pestilence, which, whether disseminated by the influence of the celestial bodies, or sent upon us mortals by God, in his just wrath, by way of retribution for our iniquities, had had its origin some years before in the East, whence, after destroying an innumerable multitude of living beings, it had propagated itself without respite, from place to place, and so calamitously had spread into the West. In Florence, despite all that human wisdom and forethought could devise to avert it, as the cleansing of the city from many impurities by officials appointed for the purpose, the refusal of entrance to all sick folk, and the adoption of many precautions for the preservation of health, despite also humble supplications addressed to God, and often repeated both in public procession and otherwise, by the devout, towards the beginning of the spring of the said year, the doleful effects of the pestilence began to be horribly apparent by symptoms that shewed as if miraculous. Not such were they as in the East, where an issue of blood from the nose was a manifest sign of inevitable death, but in men and women alike it first betrayed itself by the emergence of certain tumours, in the groin or the armpits, some of which grew as large as a common apple, others as an egg, some more, some less, which the common folk called gavoccioli. From the two said parts of the body this deadly gavoccioli soon began to propagate, and spread itself in all directions indefinitely, after which the form of the malady began to change. Black spots, or livid making, their appearance in many cases on the arm or the thigh or elsewhere, now few and large, now minute and numerous. And as the Gavocciolo had been, and still was an infallible token of approaching death, such also were these spots, on whomsoever they shewed themselves. Which malady seemed to set entirely at naught, both the art of the physician and the virtues of physic. Indeed, whether it was that the disorder was of a nature to defy such treatment, or that the physicians were at fault, 
Besides the qualified, there was now a multitude both of men and of women, who practised without having received the slightest tincture of medical science, and being in ignorance of its source, failed to apply the proper remedies. In either case, not merely were those that recovered few, but almost all, within three days from the appearance of the said symptoms, sooner or later, died, and in most cases without any fever or other attendant malady. Moreover, the virulence of the pest was the greater by reason that intercourse was apt to convey it from the sick to the whole, just as fire devours things dry or greasy when they are brought close to it. Nay, the evil went yet further, for not merely by speech or association with the sick was the malady communicated to the healthy with consequent peril of common death, but any that touched the clothes of the sick or aught else that had been touched or used by them seemed thereby to contract the disease. So marvellous sounds that, which I have now to relate, that, had not many, and I among them, observed it with their own eyes, I had hardly dared to credit it, much less to set it down in writing, though I had had it from the lips of a credible witness. I say, then, that such was the energy of the contagion of the said pestilence, that it was not merely propagated from man to man, but what is much more startling, it was frequently observed that things which had belonged to one sick or dead of the disease, if touched by some other living creature, not of the human species, were the occasion not merely of sickening, but of an almost instantaneous death. Whereof my own eyes, as I said a little before, had cognizance, one day among others, by the following experience. The rags of a poor man who had died of the disease being strewn about the open street, two hogs came thither, and after, as is their wont, no little trifling with their snouts, took the rags between their teeth, and tossed them to and fro about their chaps, whereupon almost immediately they gave a few turns, and fell down dead, as if by poison, upon the rags, which in an evil hour they had disturbed. In which circumstances, not to speak of many others of a similar or even graver complexion, diverse apprehensions and imaginations were engendered in the minds of such as were left alive, inclining almost all of them to the same harsh resolution, to wit, to shun and abhor all contact with the sick, and all that belonged to them, thinking thereby to make each his own health secure. Among whom there were those who thought that to live temperately, and avoid all excess, would count for much, as a preservative against seizures of this kind. Wherefore they banded together, and dissociating themselves from all others, formed communities in houses, where there were no sick, and lived a separate and secluded life, which they regulated with the utmost care, avoiding every kind of luxury, but eating and drinking very moderately of the most delicate wines and the finest wines, holding converse with none but one another, lest tidings of sickness or death should reach them, and diverting their minds with music and such other delights as they could devise. Other, the bias of whose minds was in the opposite direction, maintained that to drink freely, frequent places of public resort, and take their pleasure with song and revel, sparing to satisfy no appetite, and to laugh and mock at no event, was the sovereign remedy for so great an evil, and that which they affirmed they also put in practice, so far as they were able, resorting day and night, now to this tavern, now to that, drinking with an entire disregard of rule or measure, and by preference making the houses of others, as it were, their ends, if they but saw in them aught that was particularly to their taste or liking, which they were readily able to do, because the owners, seeing death imminent, had become a reckless of their property as of their lives, so that most of the houses were open to all comers, and no distinction was observed between the stranger who presented himself and the rightful lord. Thus, adhering even to their inhuman determination to shun the sick, as far as possible, they ordered their life. In this extremity of our city's suffering and tribulation, the venerable authority of laws, human and divine, was abased, and all but totally dissolved, 
for lack of those who should have administered and enforced them, most of whom, like the rest of the citizens, were either dead or sick, or so hard bested by servants that they were unable to execute any office, whereby every man was free to do what was right in his own eyes. Not a few there were who belonged to neither of the two said parties, but kept a middle course between them, neither laying the same restraint upon their diet as the former, nor allowing themselves the same license in drinking and other dissipations as the latter, but living with a degree of freedom sufficient to satisfy their appetites, and not as recluses. They therefore walked abroad, carrying in their hands flowers of fragrant herbs, or diverse sorts of spices, which they frequently raised to their noses, deeming it an excellent thing thus to comfort the brain with such perfumes, because the air seemed to be everywhere laden and reeking with the stench emitted by the dead and the dying, and the odors of drugs. Some again, the most sound perhaps in judgment, as they were also the most harsh in temper of all, affirmed that there was no medicine for the disease, superior or equal in efficiency, to flight, following which prescription a multitude of men and women, negligent of all but themselves, deserted their city, their houses, their estates, their kinsfolk, their goods, and went into voluntary exile, or migrated to the country parts, as if God, in visiting men with this pestilence, in requital of their iniquities, would not pursue them with his wrath wherever they might be, but intended the destruction of such alone as remained within the circuit of the walls of the city, or deeming perchance that it was now time for all to flee from it, and that its last hour was come. Of the adherents of these diverse opinions, not all died, neither did all escape, but rather there were, of each sort and in every place, many that second, and by those who retained their health, were treated after the example which they themselves, while whole, had set, being everywhere left to languish in almost total neglect. Tedious were it to recount how to citizen avoided citizen, how among neighbors was scarce found any that showed fellow feeling for another, how kinsfolk held aloof, and never met, or but rarely, enough that this sore affliction entered so deep into the minds of men and women, that in the horror thereof, brother was forsaken by brother, nephew by uncle, brother by sister, and oftentimes husband by wife, nay, what is more, and scarcely to be believed, fathers and mothers were found to abandon their own children, untended and visited, to their fate, as if they had been strangers." Wherefore the sick of both sexes, whose number could not be estimated, were left without resource but in the charity of friends, and few such there were, or in the interest of servants, who were hardly to be had, at high rates and on unseemly terms, and being moreover one and all, men and women of gross understanding, and for the most part unused to such offices, concerned themselves no further than to supply the immediate and expressed wants of the sick, and to watch them die, in which service they themselves not seldom perished with their gains. In consequence of which dearth, of servants and dereliction of the sick by neighbors, kinsfolk and friends, it came to pass, a thing perhaps never before heard of, that no woman, however dainty, fair or well, born she might be, shrank, when stricken with the disease, from the ministrations of a man, no matter whether he were young or no, or scrappled to expose to him every part of her body, with no more shame than if he had been a woman, submitting of necessity to that which her malady required, wherefrom perchance there resulted in after time some loss of modesty in such as recovered, besides which many succumbed, who with proper attendance would perhaps have escaped death, so that, what with the virulence of the plague and the lack of due tendance of the sick, the multitude of the deaths that daily and nightly took place in the city was such that those who heard the tale, not to say witness the fact, were struck dumb with amazement, whereby practices contrary to the former habits of the citizens could hardly fail to grow up among the survivors. It had been, as today it still is, the custom for the women that were neighbors and of kin to the deceased to gather in his house with the woman 
that were most closely connected with him, to wail with them in common, while on the other hand his male kinsfolk and neighbors, with not a few of the other citizens, and the due proportion of the clergy according to his quality, assembled without, in front of the house, to receive the corpse. And so the dead man was borne on the shoulders of his peers, with funeral pomp of taper and dirge, to the church selected by him before his death which rites at the pestilence waxed in fury, were either in whole or in great part disused, and gave way to others of a novel order. For not only did no crowd of women surround the bed of the dying, but many passed from this life unregarded, and few indeed were they to whom were accorded the lamentations and bitter tears of sorrowing relations. Nay, for the most part, their place was taken by the laugh, the jest, the festal gathering, Observances which the woman, domestic piety in large measure set aside, had adopted with very great advantage to their health. Few also there were whose bodies were attended to the church, by more than ten or twelve of their neighbors, and those not the honorable and respected citizens, but a sort of corpse-carriers, drawn from the baser ranks, who called themselves Beccini, and performed such offices for hire, would shoulder the bier, and with hurried steps carry it not to the church of the dead man's choice, but to that which was nearest at hand, with four or six priests in front, and a candle or two, or perhaps none. Nor did the priests distress themselves with too long or solemn an office, but with the aid of the Piccini hastily consigned the corpse to the first tomb which they found untenanted. The condition of the lower, and perhaps in great measure of the middle ranks, of the people showed even worse and more deplorable, for, Deluded by hope, or constrained by poverty, they stayed in their quarters, in their houses, where they sickened by thousands a day, and being without service or help of any kind, were, so to speak, irredeemably devoted to the death which overtook them. Many died daily or nightly in the public streets. Of many others who died at home, the departure was hardly observed by their neighbors, until the stench of their putrefying bodies carried the tidings. And what with their corpses and the corpses of others who died on every hand, the whole place was a sepulchre. It was the common practice of most of the neighbors, moved no less by fear of contamination, by the putrefying bodies, than by charity towards the deceased, to drag the corpses out of the houses with their own hands, aided perhaps by a porter, if a porter was to be had, and to lay them in front of the doors, where any one who made the round might have seen, especially in the morning, more of them than he could count. Afterwards they would have beers brought up, or in default planks, whereupon they laid them. Nor was it once or twice only that one and the same beer carried two or three corpses at once. But quite a considerable number of such cases occurred, one beer sufficing for husband and wife, two or three brothers, father and son, and so forth. And times without number it happened, that, as two priests, Bearing the cross, were on their way to perform the last office for some one. Three or four beers were brought up by the porters, in rear of them, so that, whereas the priests supposed that they had but one corpse to bury, they discovered that there were six or eight, or sometimes more. Nor, for all their number, were their obsequies honored by either tears or lights, or crowds of mourners. Rather it was come to this, that the dead man was then of no more account than a dead goat would be to-day. From all which it is abundantly manifest, that that lesson of patient resignation, which the sages were never able to learn from the slight and infrequent mishaps which occur in the natural course of events, was now brought home, even to the minds of the simple, by the magnitude of their disasters, so that they became indifferent to them. As consecrated ground there was not in extent sufficient to provide tombs for the vast multitude of corpses, which day and night, and almost every hour, were brought in eager haste to the churches for interment, least of all, if ancient custom were to be observed, and a separate resting place assigned to each. They dug for each graveyard, as soon as it was full, a huge trench, in which they laid the corpses, as they arrived by hundreds at a time, peeling them up as merchandise is stowed in the hold of a ship tier upon tier, each covered with a little earth, until the trench could hold no more. 
but I spared to rehearse with minute particularity each of the woes that came upon our city, and say in brief that, harsh as was the tenor of her fortunes, the surrounding country knew no mitigation, for there, not to speak of the castles, each, as it were, a little city in itself, in sequestered village, or on the open champagne, by the wayside, on the farm, in the homestead, the poor helpless husbandsmen and their families, forlorn of physician's care or servant's tenants, perish day and night alike, not as men, but rather as beasts. Wherefore they too, like the citizens, abandoned all rule of life, all habit of industry, all counsel of prudence, nay, one and all, as if expecting each day to be their last, not merely ceased to aid nature to yield her fruit in due season, of their beasts and their lands and their past labors, but left no means unused, which ingenuity could devise, to waste their accumulated store, denying shelter to their oxen, asses, sheep, goats, pigs, foals, nay, even to their dogs, man's most faithful companions, and driving them out into the fields, to roam at large, amid the unsheathed, nay, and reaped corn, many of which, as if endowed with reason, took their fill during the day, and returned home at night, without any guidance of herdsmen. But enough of the country. What need we add, but, reverting to the city, that such and so grievous was the harshness of heaven, and perhaps in some degree of man, that, what with the fury of the pestilence, the panic of those whom it spared, and their consequent neglect or desertion of not a few of the stricken in their need, it is believed without any manner of doubt that between March and the ensuing July upwards of a hundred thousand human beings lost their lives within the walls of the city of Florence, which before the deadly visitation would not have been supposed to contain so many people. How many grand palaces, how many stately homes, how many splendid residences, once full of retainers, of lords, of ladies, were now left desolate of all, even to the meanest servant. How many families of historic fame, of vast ancestral domains, and wealth proverbial, found now no scheme to continue the succession. Now many brave men, how many fair ladies, how many gallant youths, whom any physician, were he gallant Hippocrates or Asculapius himself, would have pronounced in the soundest of health, broke fast with their kinsfolk, comrades, and friends in the morning, and when evening came, supped with their forefathers in the other world. Irksome it is to myself to rehearse in detail so sorrowful a history. Wherefore, being minded to pass over so much thereof as I fairly can, I say that our city, being thus well nigh depopulated, it so happened, as I afterwards learned from one worthy of credit, that on a Tuesday morning, after divine service, the venerable church of Santa Maria Novella was almost deserted, save for the presence of seven young ladies, habited sadly in keeping with the season. All were connected either by blood or at last as friends or neighbors, and fear and of good understanding were they all, as also of noble birth, gentle manners, and a modest sprinkliness. In age none exceeded twenty-eight, or fell short of eighteen years. Their names I would set down in due form, had I not good reason to withhold them, being solicitous lest the matters which there ensue, as told and heard by them, should in after time be occasion of reproach to any of them, in view of the ample indulgence which was then, for the reasons herefore set forth, accorded to the lighter hours of persons, of much riper years than they, but which the manners of to-day have somewhat restricted. Nor would I furnish material to detractors, ever ready to bestow their bite where praise is due, to cast by indivinous speech the least slur upon the honour of these noble ladies. Wherefore, that what each says may be apprehended without confusion, I intend to give them names, more or less appropriate to the character of each. The first, then, being the eldest of the seven, we will call Pompinea, the second, Fiametta, the third, Philomena, the fourth, Emilia, the fifth we will distinguish as Lauretta, the sixth as Neifile, and the last, not without reason, shall be named Elisa. It was not of set purpose, 
but by mere chance that these ladies met in the same part of the church, but at length grouping themselves into a sort of circle, after heaving a few sighs, they gave up saying pater nostrus and began to converse, among other topics, on the times. So they continued for a while, and then Pampinea, the rest listening in silent attention, thus began. Dear ladies mine, often have I heard it said, as you doubtless as well as I, that wrong is done to none, by whoso but honestly uses his reason, and to fortify, preserve, and defend his life to the utmost of his power, is the dictate of natural reason in every one that is born, which right is accorded in such measure that in defence thereof men have been held blameless in taking life. And if this be allowed by the laws, albeit on their stringency, depends the well-being of every mortal, how much more exempt from censure should we, and all other honest folk, be in taking such means as we may, for the preservation of our life? As often as I bethink me, how we have been occupied this morning, and not this morning only, and what has been the tenor of our conversation, I perceive, and you will be readily do the like, that each of us is apprehensive on her own account. Nor there I do I marvel, but at this I do marvel greatly, that though none of us lacks a woman's wit, yet none of us has recourse to any means to avert that which we all justly fear. Here we tarry, as if methinks, for no other purpose than to bear witness to the number of the corpses that are brought hither for the interment, or to hearken, if the brothers there within, whose number is now almost reduced to naught, chant their offices at the canonical hours, or by our weeds of woe, to obtrude on the attention of every one that enters, the nature and degree of our sufferings. And if we quit the church, we see dead or sick folk carried about, or we see those, who for their crimes were of late condemned to exile by the outraged majesty of the public laws, but who now, in contempt of those laws, while knowing that their ministers are a prey to death or disease, have returned, and traverse the city in packs, making it hideous with their riotous antics. Or else we see the refuse of the people, fostered on our blood, Bicini, as they call themselves, who for our torment go prancing about here and there and everywhere, making mock of our miseries and querulous songs. Nor hear we aught but, such and such are dead, or such and such are dying, and should hear dolorous wailing on every hand, were there but any to wail. Or go we home, what see we there? I know not if you are in like case with me, but there, where once were servants in plenty, I find none left but my maid, and shudder with terror, and feel the very hairs of my head to stand on end, and turn, or tarry, where I may, I encounter the ghosts of the departed, not with their wanted mien, but with something horrible in their aspect that appalls me. For which reason church and street and home are alike distressful to me, and the more so that none, methinks, having means and place of retirement as we have, abides here save only we. Or if any such there be, they are of those, as my senses too often have borne witness, who make no distinction between things honourable and their opposites. So they but answer the cravings of appetite, and alone or in company do daily and nightly what things soever give promise of most gratification. Nor are these secular persons alone, but such as live recluse in monasteries break their rule, and give themselves up to carnal pleasures, persuading themselves that they are permissible to them, and only forbidden to others, and thereby thinking to escape are become unchaste and dissolute. If such be our circumstances, and such most manifestly they are, what do we hear? What we wait for? What dream we of? Why are we less prompt to provide for our own safety than the rest of the citizens? Is life less dear to us than to all other women? Or think we that the bond which unites soul and body is stronger in us than in others, so that there is no blow that may light upon it, of which we need be apprehensive? If so, we err, we are deceived. What insensat folly were it in us to be so believed? We have but to call to mind the number and condition of those, young as we, and of both sexes, who have succumbed to this cruel pestilence, to find therein conclusive evidence to the contrary. 
unless from lethargy or indolence we fall into the vain imagination that by some lucky accident we may in some way or another when we would escape i know not if your opinion accord with mine i should deem it most wise in us our case being what it is if as many others have done before us and are still doing we were to quit this place and shunning like death the evil example of others betake ourselves to the country and there live as honourable women on one of the estates of which none of us has any lack with all cheer of festal gathering and other delights so long as in no particular we overstep the bounds of reason there we shall hear the chant of birds have sight of verdant hills and plains of cornfields undulating like the sea of trees of a thousand sorts there also we shall have a larger view of the heavens which however harsh to usward yet deny not their eternal beauty sinks fire far to ape to rest on that the desolate walls of our city moreover we shall there breathe the fresh air find ampler store of things meet for such as live in these times have fewer causes of annoy for though the husbandsmen die there even as here the citizens they are dispersed in scattered homesteads and tis thus less painful to witness nor so far as i can see is there a soul here whom we shall desert rather we may truly say that we are ourselves deserted for our kinsfolk being either dead or fled in fear of death no more regardful of us than if we were strangers we are left alone in our great affliction no censure then shall fall on us if we do as i propose and otherwise grievous suffering perhaps death may ensue wherefore if you agree it is my advice that attended by our maids with all things needful we sojourn now on this now on the other estate and in such way of life continue until we see if death should not first overtake us the end which heaven reserves for these events and i remind you that it will be at least as seemly in us to leave with honour as in others of whom there are not a few to stay with dishonour the other ladies praised pampinea's plan and indeed were so prompt to follow it that they had already began to discuss the manner in some detail as if they were forthwith to rise from their seats and take the road when philomena whose judgment was excellent interposed saying ladies though pimpinea has spoken to most excellent effect yet it were not well to be so precipitate as you seem disposed to be bethink that we are all women nor is there any here so young but she is of years to understand how women are minded towards one another when they are alone together and how ill they are able to rule themselves without the guidance of some man we are sensitive perverse suspicious pusillanimous and timid wherefore i much misdoubt that if we find no other guidance than our own this company is like to break up sooner and with less credit to us than it should against which it were well to provide at the outset said the eliza without doubt man is woman's head and without man's governance it is seldom that aught that we do is brought to a commendable conclusion but how are we to come by the men every one of us here knows that her kinsmen are of the most part dead and that the survivors are dispersed one here one there we know not where bent each on escaping the same fate as ourselves nor were it seemly to seek the aid of strangers for as we are in quest of health we must find some means so to order matters that wherever we seek diversion or repose trouble and scandal do not follow us while the ladies were thus conversing there came into the church three young men young i say but not so young that the age of the youngest was less than twenty-five years in whom neither the sinister course of events nor the loss of friends or kinsfolk nor fear for their own safety had availed to quench or even temper the ardour of their love the first was called pamphilo the second philostrato and the third dioneo very debonair and chivalrous were they all and in this troublous time they were seeking if haply to their exceeding great solace they might have sight of their fair friends all three of whom chanced to be among the said seven ladies besides some that were of kin to the young men 
At one and the same moment they recognized the ladies and were recognized by them, wherefore with a gracious smile Pompinea thus began. Lo, fortune is propitious to our enterprise, having vouchsafed us the good offices of these young men, who are as gallant as they are discreet, and will gladly give us their guidance and escort, so we but take them into our service. Whereupon, Neifila, crimson from brow to neck with the blush of modesty, being one of those that had a lover among the young men, said, For God's sake, Pompinea, have a care what you say. Well assured am I that naught but good can be said of any of them, and I deem that fit for office far more onerous than this which you propose for them, and their good and honourable company worthy of ladies fairer by far, and more tenderly to be cherished than such as we. But it is no secret that they love some of us here, wherefore I misdoubt that, if we take them with us, we may thereby give occasion for scandal, and censure merited neither by us nor by them. That, said Philomena, is of no consequence. So I but live honestly, my conscience gives me no disquietude, if others asperse me. God and the truth will take arms in my defence. Now, should they be disposed to attend us, of a truth we might say with Pompinea, that fortune favours our enterprise. The silence which followed betokened consent on the part of the other ladies, who then with one accord resolved to call the young men, and acquaint them with their purpose, and praise them to be of their company. So without further parley, Pompinea, who had a kinsman among the young men, rose and approached them where they stood, intently regarding them. And greeting them gaily, she opened to them their plan, and besought them on the part of herself and her friends, to join their company on terms of honourable and fraternal comradeship. At first the young men thought she did but trifle with them, but when they saw that she was in earnest, they answered with alacrity that they were ready, and promptly, even before they left the church, set matters in train for their departure. So all things meet being first sent forward in due order to their intended place of sojourn, the ladies with some of their maids, and the three young men, each attended by a man's servant, sallied forth of the city on the morrow, being Wednesday, about daybreak, and took the road, nor had they journeyed more than two short miles, when they arrived at their destination. The estate lay upon a little hill, some distance from the nearest highway, and embowered in shrubberies of diverse hues, and other greenery, afforded the eye a pleasant prospect. On the summit of the hill was a palace, with galleries, halls, and chambers, disposed around a fair and spacious court, each very fair in itself, and the goodlier to see for the gladsome pictures with which it was adorned. The whole set amidst meads and gardens, laid out with marvellous art, wells of the coolest water, and vaults of the finest vines, things more suited to dainty drinkers than to sober and honourable women. On their arrival the company, to their no small delight, found their beds already made, the rooms well swept and garnished with flowers, of every sort, that the season could afford, and the floors carpeted with rushes. When they were seated, Dioneo, a gallant who had not his match for courtesy and wit, spoke thus, My ladies, tis not our forethought so much as your own mother wit, that has guided us hither. How you mean to dispose of your cares I know not. Mine I left behind me within the city gate, when I issued thence with you a brief while ago. Wherefore I pray you, either address yourselves to make merry, to laugh and sing with me, so far I mean as may consist with your dignity, or give me leave to hie me back to the stricken city, there to abide with my cares. To whom blithely Pompinea replied, as if she too had cast off all her cares. Well sayest thou, Dioneo, excellently well. Gaily we mean to live, it was a refuge from sorrow, that there we sought nor had we other cause to hums hither. But as no anarchy can long endure, I, who initiated the deliberations of which this fair company is the fruit, do now, to the end that our joy may be lasting, deem it expedient, that there be one among us in chief authority, honoured and obeyed by us as our superior, 
whose exclusive care it shall be to devise how we may pass our time blithely, and that each in turn may prove the weight of the care, as well as enjoy the pleasure of sovereignty, and no distinction being made of sex, and why be felt by none, by reason of exclusion from the office, I propose that the weight and honour be borne by each one for a day, and let the first to bear sway be chosen by us all, those that follow to be appointed towards the vesper hour by him or her, who shall have had the seniory for that day. And let each holder of the seniory be, for the time, sole arbiter of the place and manner in which we are to pass our time. Pompinea's speech was received with the utmost applause, and with one accord she was chosen queen for the first day. Whereupon Philomena hid her lightly to a bay tree, having often heard of the great honour in which its leaves, and such as were deservedly crowned therewith, were worthy to be holden. And having gathered a few sprays, she made thereof a goodly wreath of honour, and set it on Pompinea's head, which wreath was thenceforth, while their company endured, the visible sign of the wearer's sway and sovereignty. No sooner was Queen Pompinea crowned, than she bade all be silent, she then caused summon to her presence the four maids, and the servants of the three young men, and all keeping silence said to them, That I may show you all at once how, while still giving place to better, our company may flourish and endure, as long as it shall pleasure us, with order meet and assured delight, and without reproach. I first of all constitute Dioneo's man, Parmeno, my seneschal, and entrust him with the care, and control of all our household, and all that belongs to the service of the whole. Pamphilo's man, Sirisco, I appoint treasurer and counsellor of our excure, and be he ever answerable to Parmeno. While Parmeno and Sirisco are too busy about their duties to serve their masters, let Philostratos' man, Tindaro, have charge of the chambers of all three. My maid, Mysia, and Philomena's maid, Lykiska, will keep in the kitchen, and with all due diligence, prepare such dishes as Parmeno shall bid them. Lauretta's maid, Chimera, and Fiametta's maid, Stratilia, we make answerable for the ladies' chambers, and wherever we may take up our quarters, let them see that all is spotless. And now we enjoin you, one and all alike, as you value our favour, that none at you go where you may, return whence you may, hear or see what you may, bring us any tidings but such as be cheerful. These orders thus succinctly given were received with universal approval, whereupon Pompinea rose and said gaily, Here are gardens, meads, and other places delightsome enough, where you may wander at will and take your pleasure, but on the stroke of tears let all be here to breakfast in the shade. Thus dismissed by their new queen, the gay company sauntered gently through the garden, the young men saying sweet things to the fair ladies, who wove fair garlands of diverse sorts of leaves, and sang love-songs. Having thus spent the time allowed them by the queen, they returned to the house, where they found that Parmeno had entered on his office with zeal, for in a hall on the ground floor they saw tables covered with the whitest of clothes, and beakers that shone like silver, and sprays of broom scattered everywhere. So at the bidding of the queen they washed their hands, and all took their places as marshalled by Parmeno. Dishes daintily prepared were served, and the finest wines were at hand. The three serving men did their office noiselessly. In a word, all was fair and ordered in a seemly manner, whereby the spirits of the company rose, and they seasoned their viands, with pleasant jests and sprightly sallies. Breakfast done, the tables were removed, and the queen bade fetch instruments of music, for all, ladies and young men alike, knew how to tread a measure, and some of them played and sang with great skill. So at her command, Dionevo, having taken a lute, and Fiometta a viol, they struck up a dance in sweet concert, and the servants being dismissed to their repast, the queen, attended by the other ladies and the two young men, led off a stately carol, which ended, they fell to singing ditties, dainty and gay. 
Thus they diverted themselves until the queen, deeming it time to retire to rest, dismissed them all for the night. So the three young men and the ladies withdrew to their several quarters, which were in different parts of the palace. There they found the beds well made, and abundance of flowers, as in the hall, and so they undressed, and went to bed. Shortly after noon the queen rose, and roused the rest of the ladies, as also the young men, averring that it was injurious to the health to sleep long in the daytime. They therefore hid them to a meadow, where the grass grew green and luxuriant, being nowhere scorched by the sun, and a light breeze gently fanned them. So at the queen's command they all ranged themselves in a circle on the grass, and hearkened while she thus spoke. You mark that the sun is high, the heat intense, and the silence unbroken, save by the cicalas among the olive trees. It were therefore the hate of folly to quit this spot at present. Here the air is cool and the prospect fair, and here, observe, are dice and chess. Take then your pleasure as you may be severally minded, but if you take my advice, you will find pastime for the hot hours before us, not in play, in which the loser must needs be vexed, and neither the winner nor the onlooker much be better pleased, but in telling of stories, in which the invention of one may afford solace to all the company of his hearers. You will not each have told the story before the sun will be low, and the heat abated, so that we shall be able to go and severally take our pleasure, where it may seem best to each. Wherefore, if my proposal meet with your approval, for in this I am disposed to consult your pleasure, let us adopt it, if not, divert yourselves as you best you may, until the vesper hour. The queen's proposal being approved by all, ladies and men alike, she added, So please you, then, I ordain, that for this first day we be free to discourse of such matters, as most commend themselves to each in turn. She then addressed Pamphilo, who sat on her right hand, bidding him with a gracious air to lead off with one of his stories. And prompted the word of command, Pamphilo, while all listened intently, thus began. End of Introduction of the First Day